Two major court cases that dominated the headlines this week. Firstly, Dr. Nandipa Magudumana's application for leave to appeal was dismissed by the Free State High Court with costs and the Senzo Meyua trial, that's the murder trial, it had to start afresh in the Pretoria High Court with a new judge presiding. Kelly Kamalo's sister, Zandile, took the stand as the first state witness and uh, to review these two cases with a legal analyst, Malusi Tulu, is what we're about to do now. He's the managing director at Donda Attorneys. Uh, great to have you. Thanks very, very much for your time, Malusi. Uh, good morning, Leanne, and good morning to the viewers at home. Let's start off with um, the, the whole Tabo Besta case now. So does convicted murderer and rapist Tabo Besta's girlfriend, Dr. Nandipa Magudumana, still have other legal avenues to pursue because as we have now seen the, the final ruling is that they've dismissed with costs her application for leave to appeal against her arrest yes indeed her appeal was dismissed but she can still uh, appeal directly to the supreme court of appeal in Lufontaine, or um, she can also ask for direct access to the constitutional court which means uh, she can just directly ask that uh, the constitutional court hears the matter because she would say maybe it's in the public, it's in the public interest and because it's a constitutional matter. So she still has those options. Otherwise, she can go back to the Bluefontaine Magistrate Court and apply for a bail and do a bail application, which in my view might be a bit challenging, which is why I think her legal team decided to challenge her arrest and say it was unlawful and to challenge the deportation and say it was dis the deportation, the assertion was disguised as a deportation. So I believe that the option would be rather to continue with the application than going to a bail application that makes the court. Yeah. I mean, should uh, Dr. Magudumana petition the Supreme Court of Appeal, as you say, and succeed in her appeal, ca can she still be rearrested? And, and can the, uh, the, the NPA and the SAPS still issue the warrant of arrest and reinstate all of those charges? Yes, in the founding papers, um, I, I remember quite clearly that she did not specify to say, she was not specific in saying, in this particular matter, I ask that the court ensures that the court order is directly uh, stating that I must never be arrested for this particular crime. So she can still be arrested. There's what we call maybe a J175 summons, like she can be summoned to court. And, and then she can be, you know, asked to continue and, and join the others and the other the, the other co-accused co in the case. I believe this is still an option because it, it, even though she challenges the arrest, the crime still stands and she has not asked for a court order to say she must not be arrested for this crime ever again or this alleged crime. Yeah. Um, I mean, Judge Philip Lobster said that, that based on Magudumana's submissions, he, he was not convinced that another court would arrive at a different decision. Um, I mean, that was kind of what he was saying. So if we, if we look at her chances of an appeal, I mean, do, do you think they'd be successful? I think it, it might not be successful, but um, like the judge said in, a, in his first judgment, he said, some of the things that she's challenging, maybe the, the jurisdiction is rather in Tanzania. So it just brings another complication in terms of what she can do rather than just going for an appeal. So her chances are very slight. Um, I, I believe that she she will spend a lot of time and a lot of money going where, you know, from one court to another. Um, also for, for a bail, it might be difficult. So her chances are slim. And you really do sort of touch on an on a, on a issue here in terms of cost. I mean, this is a very costly journey that uh, Dr. Nandipe is embarking on. I mean, it would, it would, one would imagine, I mean, I, I cannot imagine how, many, how much money she's actually spending on the legal fees in order to sort of go to all of these different courts. I mean, th that is a big issue. Yes, um, I've, 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 I've made an observation, you know, in the last couple of years that, not, I think generally for um, a normal person in inverted commas, it's very difficult to access these higher courts. You know, you need to have a lot of money. So one wonders whether, you know, if for, in order for you to check, get justice in, a, in an efficient and faster manner, does it mean that you have to have money, you know? I think that's one of the topics we need to look at when it comes to justice in terms of, say, 
does is it, do we really say we have justice in the country if, if you don't have money? Because let's just say uh, Dr. Nandipa didn't have the resources. She would have been probably just applying for a bail normally or she would have abandoned bail. So it, it gives you that idea that, you know, the justice system, not just in South Africa, but, you know, in the whole world, you need to have money yeah. at certain points to get you in a faster way. Absolutely, without a doubt. I, I mean, just before we move on to the next case, and, and perhaps this is for my own interest, I mean, what would something like this actually cost an individual to, to try and get to the level of a Supreme Court and then even taking it further? I mean, what amounts of money are we actually looking at? Um, I don't want to put myself in a different position, but I think you remember there were reports, I rely on reports, that you know that the daily charge for one of the advocates was uh, close to 70,000 just for one advocate. So if it's going to sit for a few days, a lot of money. So, but sometimes what you do with your legal uh, representative, you have a, an agreement and you sign that maybe you want to pay the whole amount once off. So it, it depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the arrangement. Also, there is a pro bono um, you know, option if your uh, advocate or attorney believes that they can do the matter, but it's very difficult to work for free, obviously. So it's, it's a lot of money, but I can't put a sum to it. Apparently. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I, I, I think that was just my curiosity getting into me. I would just love to sort of understand the fees associated and, and sort of verify what you're saying. To, to go that far, you know, it, it takes a lot of money and it's not open to everybody. So let's move on to the next case now. And that, of course, was a, the big one of the Senzo Meiwa trial. Um, it started from scratch. And this is, you know, one that is a, a great setback to the trial to have to start all over again. And we've got uh, Judge uh, Mokolo Heng, who is now presiding over this trial. So let's let's look at the, the, the implications for a trial like this having to start all over again. Well, the implications are that, as they say in Latin, uh, it's that's de novo, it means it's that's afresh. Um, the witnesses that were called who have testified, unfortunately, they have to start again. Like with Zandi, she started again, I think, on Tuesday. So that is the implication. Unfortunately, the, as we spoke about finances, I'll come back to that again. There are financial uh, um, implications involved for the, for the accused as well. Uh, so it's there's financial implications, and I think mentally it also affects, you know, how people uh, approach this case. Um, for the accused, I mean, you have to see it again and listen to the testimony. But uh, unfortunately, that is how the justice system works in these particular situations. Mm. And, you know, one of the things as well we're seeing is, uh, ag again, delays in this case. And, I mean, we saw um, uh, Zandi Kumalo, the, 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 the first witness, take to the stand. And, you know, she was sort of being cross-examined and then suddenly fell ill, saying that she had, she was complaining of ch chest pains. But the judge was, the judge was quite strict on this one and, and, and basically coming up and saying, uh, very frustrated and saying that he, he is not going to tolerate um, any of these sort of, delays the what did he call them uh, tolerate frivolous delays and that's sort of uh, th that that's a great worry because we've seen this case go on and on and being marred by delays and so much controversy and now we're back right at the beginning and the judge sort of setting the mandate from the very beginning just saying i'm not going to accept this i, I think we, with the judge that we have i, I don't want to compare him too much with the previous one but I jump, i'm just saying his approach is more efficient, his approach is more professional, and, 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 and he wants, you know, the, the results to be to be obtained as soon as possible. And uh, he's, 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 he's trying to assist everyone, whether it's the accused, or it's the family of the deceased, or it's the, it's the witnesses themselves to say, guys, let's work on this case. If there's a problem, he's more solution oriented. For example, he said there was a, a witness or an accused who was sick, they had to call a doctor right at that moment so that the cross-examination could continue. So we're going to see uh, less tea breaks. We're going to see less uh, short adjournments. And just for simple things, you know, he's not going to tolerate it. Yeah. So the case is going to go faster 
pace than it has been moving before. One, one can only hope that. I mean, I know the judge as well was relaying a story of 15 years back and he, a very similar incident had happened. He actually phoned a doctor, got the doctor to come in and examine the person who was complaining that they weren't well. The doctor examined them, gave him the thumbs up and the trial carried on. So this, this judge, I mean, there's a lot resting on this judge because the country needs to get answers. And this, this case needs to be finalized. Um, this, this, of course, all of these delays and starting all over, over again, you know, a lot of the, the witnesses that have spoken have already given the version of events. So perhaps maybe you can also tell us what, what impact are these delays having on the witnesses and the accused? I think the, the impact is that, you know, sometimes you get tired of you know, testifying one thing over and over again. But if you are a witness and you know that uh, for us to get the truth, because there's a public interest, in you, are the, you are the one that we're depending on. So hopefully the NPA has uh, called those witnesses who have testified and prepared with them and asked them, you know, to give it their best shot. And the accused, unfortunately, they have to uh, wait for their chance. But, you know, if I was um, one of the attorneys, or the advocates, I would probably apply for bail on new facts. If we look at um, um, the previous testimonies that were, be that were given, what, what would actually happen should there be discrepancies with the current testimonies that we're hearing now? Yes, That's, that is a very great question, uh, Lynn. Of course, the problem is um, we should not really compare what happened before to what is happening now, because as it said, it was saying the, start, the trial starts de novo, the, the trial starts afresh. Whatever happened before doesn't matter. But what is very important is that the same statements in the dockets, uh, specifically docket 639 or 14, are still the statements that will be used in this case. And if there are huge discrepancies, those discrepancies will be, will be challenged uh, when you, the oral evidence you're giving uh, deviates uh, in a huge way what you wrote on the stage. So that, that is what is relevant. But the previous case, uh, the testimony in court is, is not relevant. Not relevant. So that is sort of, it's almost like it didn't happen. So you can't even draw a comparison, even if they tell a completely different version of events to what they tell in court. So interesting to find that out. Just very quickly, the, the lawyer for singer Kelly Kumalo, Magdalene Munsami, has submitted her notice of withdrawal to the NPA. Uh, will this also change the dynamics of the case at all? No, not at all. <clears throat> the only the only thing that is relevant is that she she was there to assist, to consult, and and and, and help uh, Kelly Kumar with the case. But in terms of the case itself, uh, if you're a, a watching brief, you are there to assist the client who has an interest in this case, whether the client is an accused. I mean, sorry, whether the client is a witness or a complainant. So I don't think it's, it's, she's that relevant, but she's only relevant for Kelly Kumar.